suppose you have partitions lambda equals lambda 1 dot 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 lambda L and mu equals mu 1 dot 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 mu m, then we denote by m subscript lambda mu the number of integer matrices such that, so I will denote the entries of the matrix by lower case a i j. So, this is the entry in the ith row and jth column. If you add over all j, this is lambda i for i goes from 1 to l and if you add over i, you get mu j for j goes from 1 to m, right. And we proved that if you compute the dimension of the homomorphism between two partition representations, this number is just m lambda mu. There is also the RSK correspondence, which says that m lambda mu is a sum over nu less than or equal to lambda, nu less than or equal to mu, k nu lambda, k nu mu. In addition, we had some condition that uh, condition that k lambda lambda is equal to 1 for each lambda. And this partial order here, we say that nu is less than or equal to lambda if there exists a semi standard Young tableau of type lambda and shape nu. Right. And that we reinterpreted as saying that if you take the sum of the first i parts of nu, it is greater than or equal to the sum of the first i parts of lambda. Because of that reversal, this is usually called the reverse dominance order. It is a bit usually people take the dominance order, this is the opposite of that. Using all this and the combinatorial resolution theorem, which I proved uh, maybe two lectures ago, we were able to get the following result that for every lambda, k x lambda is a sum of mu less than or equal to lambda v mu which occurs k mu lambda for all lambda, partitions lambda. This was just a co combinatorial argument once we had all this information. And the fact that k lambda lambda is 1 means that you have v lambda occurring exactly once in a k x lambda and then you have um, the stuff which is from strictly smaller pieces. So, just to emphasize that V lambda occurs exactly once and everything else is somehow coming from smaller uh, permutation representation, uh, po smaller partition representations. This can be used as a definition of V lambda. Here I am assuming that the characteristic of k is greater than n, which means that everything is, uh, the group uh, ring is semi-simple. And throughout this lecture, I will be assuming that. In that case, you have all this, because then you have semi-simplicity and complete reducibility. This can be thought of as 
the definition of V lambda. Certainly, it lets you identify V lambda uniquely and even compute its character algorithmically, provided you can compute the character of this thing, which certainly is computable in the strict sense of the word. Now, today we look at character twists. When you have a finite group, its representations come in families, which uh, all members of this family have the same dimension. What they are are twists of each other in the following sense. A character is just a homomorphism from G to K star. So, here there is some ambiguity in uh, terminology. I said a character is the trace of a representation. Now, I am saying character is a homomorphism from G to K star. These are two different uses of the word character. These are sometimes called multiplicative characters. And these correspond to isomorphism classes of one dimensional representations. I will let you figure that out. That is a multiplicative character. K star just denotes the non-zero elements of K thought of as a group under multiplication. So, you should see here probably multiplicative. I hope that it will be clear from the context which character I am talking about. In this lecture, certainly I will only be talking about these characters. Suppose you have a character and you have a representation. which means that you have a finite dimensional, well it does not have to be finite dimensional, a vector space over k and a homomorphism from G to the linear automorphisms of V. Then you can twist this representation by this character. You just define rho tensor chi of G to be chi G rho G. This is a scalar multiple of rho G. All you are doing is you are scaling, scaling each of the um, values of the representation. For example, this means that if the original representation is simple, then so will this be simple, because if something is invariant under a bunch of uh, linear transformations, then it is also invariant under scalar multiples of those linear transformations, which is what this is doing. Let me give you an example, the one example that we are really interested in. You can start with a group of n by n matrices and perhaps the most amazing and interesting thing in linear algebra is this homomorphism from matrices to the field which is called the determinant and it is multiplicative. And you can use this to construct characters whenever you have um, homomorphism from your group into some uh, GLNK. So, we took trace to compute what we earlier called characters, but if you want these kinds of multiplicative characters, you should really take determinant. We can put S n inside this, you all know how to do this probably, right. You just take the permutation matrices and you compose this. And this is what is usually called the sign character and I will denote it by epsilon. Why is it called the sign character? Well, remember that S n is generated by transpositions that is interchanging two elements. And epsilon, the determinant of a matrix where you in take the, you take the identity matrix and interchange two columns, that is the image of a transposition under this map. Its determinant is minus 1. So, this group is generated by elements for which epsilon is minus 1. Therefore, for any element of this group, epsilon will either be plus 1 or minus 1. Now, the question is, we had these representations v lambda, which I defined 
earlier. Take this representation and you twist it by the sign character. Then what do you get? You will get V mu for some other partition mu. What is the relationship between lambda and mu? Since our handle on the simple representations of S n is through the partition representations, let us try to get a handle on twisting partition representations first. So, let us try to compute or understand I will take a permutation representation, uh, sorry a partition representation, another one which I will twist by the sign character. Let us try to understand this. It is really no harder than at least the first step is no harder than doing it in general. So, let me do it in general. take two G sets, okay, maybe finite G sets and ask and take a character chi and ask what is home G k x k y comma k x tensor chi. Now, the space, the vector space, underlying vector space for the twist is the same as the underlying vector space for the original representation, right. You are just changing the operators. Strictly speaking, one should not write it like this, but you understand what I mean. So, the underlying vector space here is still k x and we know that the linear maps from k y to k x are integral operators corresponding to functions on x cross y, right. So, the question is which functions give rise to such homomorphisms. It is very similar to what we did earlier without the chi, but now the condition will get twisted a bit. So, you can translate the question in for which k in k x cross y is t k in hom g k y comma k x tensor chi. And the analysis goes very much as before, let us just write down what it means to be a g intertwiner. It means that, well earlier we had rho x g t k, rho x g inverse is t k. Now, we have to put in this chi g here that is the only difference compared to what we had before. And last time we got that this is true if and only if, well without this chi, this was true if and only if k of g dot x comma g dot y was equal to k of x y for all x in x, y in y and g in g, well something has got to change a bit, but the calculation is the same. What you will get is here a factor of chi g, maybe so k of g x g y is chi g k of x y, a slight 
twisting of the earlier condition. Earlier it said that k was constant on the g orbits in x cross y. Now, it says well it is not constant, but still if you know its value at one point in a g orbit in x cross y, its value at every other point in the g orbit is determined by this equation. So, certainly if you prescribe the values of k at one representative for each g orbit in x cross y, you would have determined it completely. So, straight off we can say that the dimension of this space is less than or equal to what you would have without chi in it, namely the number of g orbits in x cross y. But there is a problem, it would not be equal. Okay, what I am saying is that the dimension of this space of intertwiners will be less than or equal to the number of orbits, because if you know the value of k at one point on, the, on each orbit, you know its value everywhere on that orbit. But there could be a problem. Let us consider the following situation. Um, let me just make a introduce some notation here. So, the stabilizer of x in the group G, so here x lives in a G set, is the set of the subgroup of elements of G which fix x. Now, consider the following situation. Suppose you have G in stab G x intersect stab G y, but for which chi G is not equal to 1. Okay, I will just watch. So, I will look at k G dot x G dot y. Now, since g dot x is x and g dot y is y, this should be k x y. On the other hand, the condition that we had at the other end of the board that k g x g y is chi g k x y, it gives us another prescription for k g x g y. So, k x y has to be chi g k x y, where chi g is not equal to 1. This forces k x y to be 0. So, this inequality here could be strict, if you had such elements. This is the only problem that happens. So, this is the only problem. Whenever you have orbits where this does not happen, then you will be ok. I will just uh, explain why that is the case. So, if, if for all elements which stabilize both x and y, you have chi g equals 1, then you can happily define so the condition is if the stabilizer of x in g intersected with the stabilizer of y in g is contained in the kernel of chi. Then you can define k on the orbit of x comma y by k g x g y 
is equal to chi g k x y. Well, this a priori is not going to give us a well defined function on the orbit, because it could happen that you have two different elements of the group say g and g prime, which give the same arguments to this function, then you would like this prescription to give the same answer. Okay, and this k x y you can prescribe as you wish, you can put 1 or something. So, what we need to check is that for this to be well defined, if you have also g prime x is equal to g x and g prime y is equal to g y, you want to know that chi of g is chi of g prime. But this means that g inverse g prime is in the stabilizer of x and g inverse g prime is in the stabilizer of y, which means that g inverse g prime is in the kernel of chi. That is just saying that chi inverse chi of g inverse g prime is 1, which means that chi of g is equal to chi of g prime, because chi is a multiplicative character. So, this is well defined. So, the conclusion is that if you have x comma y, a pair x comma y, which uh, has the property that the intersection of the stabilizer of x and the stabilizer of y is contained in the kernel of chi, then on that orbit you can define uh, k x y to have some non-zero value you can define k x y with some non zero value. So, you want to count the dimension of the space of intertwiners, you should only count orbits of points which have this property. Just to make things a little writable, I will define x cross y subscript chi to be pairs x comma y which have this property. Now, you should notice that this set is invariant under the diagonal action of g on x cross y. Okay, you can check that. So, this is itself a g set and what we get is that the dimension of home g k y k x tensor chi is equal to cardinality of the number of g orbits in this set. Is that clear? Let us come back to the case that we are interested in. Here it is, we were interested in a home from one partition representation to the twist by sign of the other partition representation. Suppose S comma T is a pair in x lambda cross x mu. Here lambda and mu are partitions of the same number n. S is um, a set partition of the set 1 to n of shape lambda. This is a partition of shape mu. So, our usual convention is to write this S 1 up to S L and this as T 1 up to T m. So, the theorem is we need to know when r is a pair x comma t, s comma t in the set x lambda cross x mu subscript epsilon.
that means the stabilizer of this intersect the stabilizer of this should be contained in the kernel of epsilon. And the answer is if and only if the cardinality of any intersection S i intersect T j is less than or equal to 1 for all appropriate pairs i comma j. Let me explain why this is true. What is the stabilizer of So, when is a permutation in the stabilizer of S and in the stabilizer of T? Well, it must preserve each part of S and it must preserve each part of T. Therefore, it must preserve each of the intersections S i intersect T j. And on the other hand, if it does preserve each of these intersections, it will preserve each part of S because it is a union of uh, S i intersect T 1, S i intersect T 2 and so on. It will also similarly preserve each part of T. So, the condition is that G takes S i intersect T j to itself. Now, now suppose each of these is a singleton or empty, then G must preserve each element which is in some S i intersect T j. But every element of the set 1 to n is in one of these, right? These form a partition of n also. So, if each of these sets is of has at most one element, then G is forced to be the identity because it will fix every element. G must fix that element. Hence, well, since every element occurs in one of these things, hence G is the identity, the identity automorph bijection of the set N. Well, this is certainly subgroup that is contained in the kernel of any character. So, we have that the stabilizer of x intersect the stabilizer of t is contained in the kernel of epsilon. Conversely, suppose, well, no, yeah, so for the converse, we will argue by contradiction. Suppose one of these S i intersect t j has two elements, right. If you can find R not equal to S such that R S is a subset of S i intersect T j for some i j. Then you can take the transposition which interchanges R and S. This will preserve uh, each S i and each T j. So, On the other hand, it is as I already said, this is minus 1 and usually minus 1 is not equal to plus 1. I said we can assume that the characteristic of k is greater than n. So, so 
So, that proves this theorem, right. Now, we ask what is the count of these things. Well, so this set we know is the number of orbits of g orbits in x cross y and then we look at a subset of it and look at orbits for the restriction of the g action on that. So, that will be a subset of the sets of orbits here. So, we just need to know which subset is that. Okay, and when you have these partition representations, these are given by those lambda by mu matrices. So, we need to know which lambda by mu matrices are allowed, but what are the entries of those lambda by mu matrices? They are the cardinalities of S i intersect T j. So, all you get is a restriction on the entries of the matrix. So, you still want lambda by mu matrices, but you want their entries to always be 0 or 1. So, you get the 0 1 matrices whose row sums are lambda and column sums are mu. Clear? So, what I want to define is n lambda mu to be the set of matrices with, oh god, I have been writing z here. What I want to write is z greater than or equal to 0. You should make a correction at the beginning of this lecture. So, now we have the same old conditions a i j summation over j is lambda i for i goes from 1 to L, a i j is summation over i is lambda j for j goes from 1 to m and we have this new condition that each entry a i j belongs to the set 0 or 1. And the theorem is that the dimension of the space of intertwiners between one partition representation and the a twist of the other Okay, I just want to introduce some notation. Um, this set x mu cross x lambda subscript epsilon. Okay, so, what is this set? This is the pairs of partitions S in x mu, T in x lambda such that the cardinality of S i intersect T j is less than or equal to 1 for all i j. So, I will call such pairs of um, partitions um, transverse, call these the transverse partitions. just to have a nice intuitive name instead of going on saying S i intersect T j should have at most one element and intuitively it seems to make sense. Transverse, well I would say pairs. This word partitions is fraught with uh, danger because 
when you say a partition of n you mean a sequence of numbers in non increasing order whose sum is n but when i say partitions of bold n or underlined n or the set n i mean a collection of subsets whose union is the whole thing and which are pairwise disjoint so i'll just call them transverse pairs now it's time to introduce the transpose of a partition and now i mean partition as in lambda equals lambda 1 lambda 2 lambda L. so look at the partition 2 2 1 you can draw its young diagram So two squares in the first row, two squares in the second row, and one square in the third row. That will be my convention. So this is a pictorial way of drawing. So this is the shape lambda without anything filled in. So it's not quite. Now you take this uh, diagonal axis and reflect it around that. So you get. the partition 3 2 and i call that the transpose of lambda and denoted by lambda prime now you can ask yourself okay this is a visual way of looking at it what is the what are these parts actually can you describe these numbers here well the first thing uh, this 3 is simply the number of non zero parts in this partition Okay, in other words, it's the number of parts of this partition whose size is greater than or equal to one, and this two is the number of parts of this partition whose size is greater than or equal to two, and this partition has no parts which are of size greater than or equal to three, so it stops there. That's the definition. Lambda prime one is equal to number of non-zero parts. of lambda i mean we are just thinking of partitions as having non zero parts but sometimes it's convenient to allow some trailing zeros um and in general lambda prime j is equal to number of parts greater than or equal to j that's the description of the transpose partition now these things come up very naturally when you start looking at zero one matrices let me explain why here it's a nice lemma n lambda lambda prime so this is the number of matrices whose entries are 0 and 1 whose row sums are lambda and column sums are lambda prime and this is equal to 1 for every partition lambda And so, a proof. I'll just give you an example, and I'll leave you to figure out the proof yourself. Take lambda equals, well, whatever you like. Let's take six, five, three, three, and I'll draw for you the only zero one matrix whose row sums are six, five, three, three, and column sums are the transpose of this. Whatever that is, we'll figure it out soon. So, you, what you do is you take six ones in the first row. then you take five ones in the second row 
Essentially, I am drawing the Young diagram with ones, but that is not what we want. We want a matrix. So, you just put in zeros here and make it rectangular. What is the sum of this? It is 6, 5, 3, 3, but what are these sums? Well, these are precisely the parts of the transpose partition. So, and this is the only one. You should prove this by induction maybe on the size of this thing or something. It is not very difficult. So, you see transposers seem to have a special role to play when you talk about 0, 1 matrices. Here is another lemma of which shows that transposers play a role. Suppose you have two partitions of n, then I can tell you when this number is going to be positive. This number being positive just means that you have transverse um, set partitions, so transverse pairs of shapes lambda and mu. And the condition for this is just uh, that mu prime is less than or equal to lambda. We will use this characterization that this is positive means that you have a transverse pair. Given a transverse pair, we will construct. So, what we will do is given a transverse pair, we will construct a semi standard Young tableau of type lambda and shape mu prime. That will do the proof of n lambda mu greater than 0 implies mu prime less than or equal to lambda. x lambda cross x mu, we will construct a semi standard Young tableau of shape mu prime. We saw in one of the earlier lectures that if you have such a thing, then mu prime must be less than or equal to lambda. What you do is, you use this S and T to construct some tableau, which do not have the correct order properties for a semi-standard Young tableau. They are just Young diagrams with some numbers fixed, filled in. Y subscript S is going to be the tableau with um, the parts of S as rows. As rows, huh? and Y prime T will be the tableau with the parts of T as columns. Better to illustrate this with an example. So suppose S is 1, 2, 3, union 4, 6, 7, union 5, 8, and T. I should be careful to make sure that it is transverse. 2, 5, 7. So, these are all from different parts of the first thing. Union 4, 1. These are also from different parts. Union 3, 8. Union, what is left? 6. 
Okay, I got me a pair of transverse partitions. Uh, uh, I got me a transverse pair. Now let me construct this y s and y prime t. I'll erase this. So y s is just a tableau with parts of s as rows. So y s is just 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 5, 8. Okay, these are not in any particular order. It is not a semi standard young tableau, it is just such a configuration. And y prime t is again just some configuration 2, 5, 7, 4, 1, 3, 8, 6. Now, note that the elements in the first row of y s will occur in different columns of y prime t. This is just a restatement of the transverse pair property, because these are the, these three are the elements in the first part of s, they must occur in different parts of t. So, they must occur in different columns of this. Therefore, I can, each column of this has exactly one of those, I can move them up to the top of the column. You just float them up. Each element of the first row of y s occurs in a different column of y prime t. You can permute the columns of y prime t to move them up. This does not really change t at all, because the columns of t are the, you can reorder within the columns. Move them to the first row. What you have is that the first row of y prime t contains all the elements of S 1. Therefore, the first row in y prime of t has enough space for all the elements of s 1. What is the shape of y prime t? It is mu prime, because we made the columns the parts of t. So, what this is saying is that lambda 1, which is the number of elements in the first row of this, is less than or equal to the amount of space in the first row of y prime t. lambda 1 is less than or equal to mu 1 prime. Good, that is the first of the many conditions we wanted. Now, what I did is I moved those up. So, this one is uh, 2, 5, 7 is fine, 2 is from the first part. Here, I need to put this 1 up here. Okay, so, at this stage, I will have 2, 5, 7, 1, 4 and 3 is already good and 6. And now, what I will do is I will freeze these elements. I will not let them move anymore, no matter what. These are frozen. Okay. On the next step, you take the second part of S. Those guys again occur in different columns of y prime t. And again, I can float them up, subject to not changing any of the frozen stuff. And where will they come to rest? They will come to rest either in the first row or beneath something from S 1. Each element of the second row y s occurs in a different column of y prime t. So, this is a float them up without disturbing the frozen entries. So, 
So here what I have is I have already frozen 2, 1, 3 and now um, I want to make sure that 5, 1, uh, hey something wrong here is it? No, 2, 1, 3 good. So, 4, 6 and 7 I need to make sure that they get floated up. So, this 7 needs to float up and then the 5 goes down and let me freeze that also and uh, 4 is already there where I want it and this 6 gets frozen. Okay, but these guys they either end up in the first row or below something from uh, S1. So, they end up either in the first row or second row. Therefore, there is enough space in the first two rows of y prime t to accommodate the first two parts of S, which means that lambda 1 plus lambda 2 is less than or equal to mu prime 1 plus mu prime 2. Now, you can probably guess what to do after this and this example is kind of running out, uh, you are pretty much done here. Now, you take the third part of S, each of those elements occur in different columns of T, subject to you know not messing around with the frozen parts, you float each of those up. Now, they would come to rest below an element of S2, which would be below an element of S1 or in the first row or they could come to rest below an element of S1 or they could be in the first row. In any case, they will be in the first three rows. So, there is enough space in the first three rows to accommodate S1, S2 and S3. So, that just translates into this condition and so on. You end up with the part of our lemma that if there exists a transverse pair in x lambda cross x mu, then mu prime is less than or equal to lambda or in other words, if n lambda mu is greater than or equal to 0, then mu prime is less than or equal to lambda. Now, what we want to do is prove the converse that if mu prime is less than or equal to lambda, then n lambda mu is greater than 0. A slightly harder thing to prove is that if mu is less than or equal to lambda, then k mu lambda is actually greater than 0. That will be a homework problem for you. This was done in plus, this will be done at home. Therefore, we can start with a semi standard young tableau of type lambda and shape mu prime. This means that mu prime is less than or equal to lambda, it is equivalent to mu prime being less equal to lambda, and then we will construct a transverse pair. This is an algorithmic proof. We will construct a transverse pair S comma T. I will just do it by example and leave you to fill in the details.
Suppose we start with a semi standard Young tableau 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3. Not a very interesting one, but it will do for the purpose. Its shape is 4. Oh, but we want its the prime of its shape. So, mu prime is 4, 3, 1, but mu is 3, 2, 2, 1, right? And lambda is 3, uh, lambda is the type, so that's 3, 3, 2. So, here we have a semi standard Young tableau of shape mu prime new prime and type lambda. And what we are going to construct is, is a transverse pair where S has shape lambda and T has shape mu. So, what you do is you label these uh, boxes, any old how, but I will just do the most uh, boring labeling. I will call this 1, I will call this 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And I will read off S and T from this labeling. So, the parts of S will be the labels of the same number. So, the first parts of S will be the labels of the ones. The second part of S will be the labels of the twos. And the third part of S will be the labels of the threes. Sorry, there are three twos. And you will all concede that since this thing was of type lambda, this is of shape lambda. What about T? Well, as you can guess, I need to take the columns of this thing and put them in. 1, 5, the labels, the first part will be the labels in the first column of this thing. This will certainly have shape um, mu because this had shape mu prime and I am taking the columns. And since um, each number 1, 2 or 3 in the original semi standard Young tableau occurs only once in each column, it means that each part of this has only uh, appears only in one of the parts of this because it have occurred in only one of the columns. So, one here I mean in each column one occurs only once. So, so in each of these uh, each of 1, 2 and 3 which correspond to the ones would occur only once. So, S and T are transverse. You can do this in uh, quite a bit of generality I will let you write down the details. Okay, these are the two basic lemmas I need. One is that n lambda lambda prime is 1 and the other is this positivity condition for n lambda mu. It is n lambda mu is positive if and only if mu prime is less than or equal to lambda. So, this n lambda lambda prime equals 1 has an easy consequence. that okay assume that the k is algebraically closed and its characteristic is greater than n then there exists a unique simple representation u lambda of sn which occurs in both kx lambda and kx lambda prime tensor epsilon and it appears in them with multiplicity 1.
Why? Well, simply because if you look at Hom S n k x lambda k x lambda prime tensor epsilon, this is n lambda lambda prime, well its dimension is n lambda lambda prime, which is 1. And so, if you remember what the dimension of the thing is, they can, this can only happen if there is a single common simple, which occurs with multiplicity 1 in each of them. In fact, uh, the Young symmetrizer construction, which we have not really talked about, identifies this subspace inside uh, either of these things. Is this clear? This is quite easy. So, this would give you an alternative way to um, construct a simple representation of S n for each partition lambda. But there are few worries now. You need to know that if you take distinct lambdas, these are actually non-isomorphic representations. In fact, it turns out that this u lambda is isomorphic to v lambda. Uh, to prove this, we will use this theorem that we had from last time that k x mu is direct sum nu less than or equal to mu v nu how many times? k nu mu times. Now, remember these guys we saw, well, or you will see, are all positive. So long as nu is less than or equal to mu, this is strictly positive. So, this tells you that uh, if you take some representation v lambda, then it occurs in precisely those partition representations for which it occurs in k x mu if and only if mu is greater than or equal to lambda, otherwise it does not occur. So, the set of partitions for which it occurs in the partition representation actually determines the lambda. Okay, v lambda is characterized by the properties it occurs in k lambda in k x lambda and it does not occur in, I am writing this negatively, um, because that is how our condition will work out as you will see in a moment, if and only if mu is not less than or equal to lambda. Right? I mean, it occurs in k x mu if and only if, sorry, um, it occurs in k x mu if and only if lambda is less than or equal to mu. So, this should be lambda is less than or equal, not less than or equal to mu, right. And these properties that is the set of partition representations which it occurs characterize v lambda. We will show that u lambda has these same properties. The first one is completely clear, because uh, we defined it as the unique thing which occurs in k x lambda and k x lambda prime tensor epsilon. So, u lambda satisfies 1 by definition. And what about 2? 
Yeah. Okay. So, so u lambda occurs in k x lambda prime tensor epsilon, it does occur in here, right. So, if it did occur in k x mu as well, then this dimension of this would be greater than 0. But by this lemma, this is equal to, well this is equal to n lambda prime mu, which is the same as n okay which is greater than 0 if and only if um, what is the condition what was the condition? What is the condition? Um, let me just dig it out. Mu prime is less than or equal to lambda prime. Hmm? Right. So, this is equivalent to lambda is less than or equal to mu. Okay. So, u lambda is v lambda and one nice corollary of this is that v lambda tensor epsilon is v lambda prime. Why is that? Well, you can see that u lambda tensor epsilon is u lambda prime, because u lambda tensor epsilon is the unique representation which occurs in k x lambda tensor epsilon and k x lambda prime tensor epsilon tensor epsilon, which is k x lambda prime. And, um, but so is u lambda prime, think about that one. So, corollary here is that V lambda tensor epsilon is isomorphic to V lambda prime. Okay, I will stop here.